I want to thank you for coming out to uh, the exhibition to support the NLU know, Bank. And uh, hope that this lecture and talk is going to be informative and interesting, certainly no doubt exciting. So as we can live vicariously through her and the images that we see. Um, my name is Phil Marquez. I'm the chair of the art department and also the gallery director. And I really wanted to keep this short and sweet so that we could spend this time for Danielle to lecture. So without any further ado, Danielle, you may. Is it okay if I take off my mask? Is it not okay? Because if anybody has a problem with it, I'll keep it on. Um, I'm triple back. <laughs> now I have some really great news for you. The great news is I will not be playing the piano. <laughs> and for those of you who um, I've known for a really long time, you'll know that that's very good news indeed. Because I don't have a musical bit of talent at all. Um, I'm good. Can everybody see me as much as they want? Okay, fantastic. So, um, what we get to do today, I'm so honored that you're here and that you're taking an hour or more out of your beautiful uh, Saturday, sunny Saturday afternoon to be here with me, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to share, share with you a little bit about the expeditions that I have been on to date. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the art from each one. And then you'll see my latest pieces, which are next door. So, uh, and then everyone cross your fingers that the video will work. Ready? Okay. We've got a very short video. So here goes. Far so good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Existence 
and remind me of the triviality of my daily concerns. For me, this is liberating and drives me to capture how Antarctica makes me feel in sketches and paintings. The voyage to Antarctica is complete, and my new voyage has begun. I have three sketchbooks full of sketches and thousands of photographs. I'm working these into oil on linen paintings for display in galleries and museums. Antarctica was a fitting end to my One World Ocean Quest as the entire planet focuses on climate change and adaptation and becomes more and more aware of the preciousness of this resource. It's been 20 years that I've been on this quest to paint all of Earth's oceans. That's what one artist five oceans is. It's one person, me, painting all five of the Earth's oceans and sharing my observations and passion to help our oceans and the waters of the world.
um, to prove that there were some, well, we know that there are cultural things that are shared between uh, people in Indonesia and people in West Africa. And his idea was, well, how did that happen, right? It could be that they told two friends, and they told two friends, and they told two friends, and they told two friends, right? Or it could be that somebody sailed and they told some people, we don't know. Or it could be, like these stone relief carvings, that this wackadoodle boat was built, and that they sailed all the way there. So anyway, he, he set out to prove that that was a possibility, and indeed, uh, we did it. So that was pretty fun. There's a, one of my paintings of the War of ship. For those of you sailors, you can notice those crazy masks. They can be square rigged or latine rigged. It's got double outriggers and a gallery along both galleries along both sides of the hull, which is fairly unusual. How many of you guys have been to the Board Temple? Yes. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, I highly recommend it. It's pretty cool. This is an example of one of my paintings. This is, of course, as you can tell, this is the VNA waterfront in Cape Town. So at this point, um, I was able to paint the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Then there was Phoenicia. So Herodotus said that, he said in 500 BC that the Phoenicians circumnavigated Africa. He said that they went clockwise around the Cape. Um, of course, there was no Suez Canal, so we don't know exactly how that could have happened. It could be that they left from the east side, or it could be that they had slaves take the ship um, from the Mediterranean. We're not, I don't think scientists are entirely sure how that happened. I'm sure one of you guys has a more up-to-date theory than I do. Um, by the way, that was 2,000 years before Bartholomew Diaz. The only reason I mention that is because back in the Stone Ages when I was in school, that's what we were taught. That it was a European guy, right? But these guys did it thousands of years before that. There's an idea of it being built. It was built in Arwad, Syria. Again, for those of you uh, boat builders in the audience, we used 8,000 olive wood tenons and 16,000 pegs. So what that means is when, when you have the planks come up like this, there's a slot in between, woodworker, where there's a slot in between, and then you, um, and so you put the tenons in there, and then you have a peg there and a peg there. So it's all wood so that it moves in the water, right? You wouldn't want to have metal in those situations because it's just going to grind a big old hole. And holes in boats don't mix. This is um, all the black dots that are on here is um, where we went. So we started up in the Mediterranean, went clockwise through the Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, around the Cape of Good Hope. Um, the boat, I wasn't on it, it was uh, two years and two months. So I wasn't on it for the full time or I'd no longer be married, right? But um, the ship went way out into the Atlantic Ocean, pretty far west in the Atlantic Ocean, and then came back. Where did you get on? I was on in um, Syria, of course, and I was also on in, um, uh, I sailed from the, um, sorry, the um, Gibraltar to Tunisia, and then I was also on for a stint um, after the Comoros in uh, South Africa. This is what I take when I go. This is where I sit in the boatyard, in the dockyard. Um, so I've developed a pretty good kit of painting tools that I take with me. Just two reds, two blues, two yellows, um, two browns, and some white. Um, in terms of paint and a couple of sketchbooks, three sketchbooks usually. Uh, I'll just sit on any old trash and paint. Now the great thing, this is Syria, the great thing about here is that the people were so nice, they would bring me coffee, 
which is great. Because in order to get the good light, of course, you have to get up pretty early. And they're, they're, they make amazing coffee. So that, that turned out well. <laughs> An example of one of my paintings from this expedition. Um, in fact, I painted this not far from where that last photograph was. It's um, quite, all of my paintings are quite formal. It's about the shapes, it's about the colors, it's about the lines in order to evoke emotion. And um, it's kind of my way of dealing with this. Because this is what it actually looks like. <laughs> So that's, that's a, I guess, another way how being a, a painter a expedition artist would be different than a photographer expedition artist, right? You just, you interpret things. And, and of course, I've exhibited uh, photographs and things like this one. Uh, shopping carts, plastic, a few prayer rugs, lots of plastic, one plastic. So that was on the other side. Those are both in the same same place. And incidentally, this area um, in the Mediterranean is where the Phoenicians lived, right? There's still evidence of the Phoenicians there. There's still Phoenician walls and things like that. So we've lived there. We humans have lived there for thousands of years. And look what we've done with it. <laughs> All right. A little bit about life on board. Um, everybody has crew duties. And the crew duties, uh, so I wasn't just there as an artist, I'm a crew member when I go on these expeditions. So that will include cleaning and cooking, you take shifts. Cleaning and cooking would be one shift. Helming, which is steering the boat, minding the helm is another um, shift, as well as keeping watch. And I'll share with you a very embarrassing story about keeping watch. <laughs> on the first expedition that I was on, the Borbador ship expedition, um, this is actually Phoenicia, but on the Borbador ship expedition, um, I was keeping watch one night. And so it would be like six hours on, six hours off, six hours on, six hours off. And I was out there, novice me, I'm in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And what you're looking for is you're looking for big boats that might not sink. Like, for example, some of these container vessels that are not far from here, they're hundreds and hundreds of feet long. They're, they can be like 400 feet long, right? So. And they won't see a little wooden boat, even though we have radar and all that kind of thing. So they won't see you. So you have to keep, you have to, you know, just like being a good driver, you have to do a defensive sail. So I'm out there and I'm looking, and I see this light coming right at us. And I'm like, oh no. So there's this light, and I look to see if it's going to the left or the right, and it's not. So I'm convinced this light is coming right at us, and we're all going to die. But I'm thinking as well, do I really want to wake the captain, right? <laughs> I wasn't so sure if I really wanted to wake the captain. Nice guy, but I wanted to let him sleep. So I watched it and watched it and watched it and watched it. And do you know what it was? Mm -hmm. It was a star. <laughs> because we were in an open sea, middle of the Indian Ocean, there was no light pollution, and the stars go right down to the horizon. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. Something to remember. I, we, we, I think of light pollution being in cities, but everywhere you go, there's light pollution. Did you wake your cap? No. <laughs> I lived to tell the story, and I did not tell the story for about 10 years. <laughs> I was too embarrassed. <laughs> so uh, while I wasn't uh, performing these duties, I will sketch. All right, the Arctic. So this next expedition, um, we went to the high Arctic. Can you see that little red arrow at the very top? So that's where we went um, all the way up to the northern end of Svalbard. Um, and this was on a three-masted Barkin team. So the Svalbard archipelago, nearly to 800 degrees, 80 degrees north. This is the Barkentine vessel. This was uh, not an art, uh, social reproduction. This was or a, a living history. This was a bunch of artists that were put together on a boat 
um, doing different artistic projects and talking about climate change and what kinds of things that we could do as artists to get people more impassioned about is although it wasn't um, living history, what it was was extreme. So I couldn't take my normal kit of things because I didn't want my oil paint to freeze. I didn't want my ink to freeze. I wasn't able to take my gloves off to sketch. Right? So it changed things quite a lot. But I came up with another pretty good kit. Um, what I do is I wear bicycle gloves you know, with the little sticky fingers, um, inside another pair of gloves. And then that way, when I'm sketching, I just take off those gloves and wear the inside gloves, which works pretty well. Um, then the other thing about the Arctic is that it's already completely abstract. Remember how I showed you the kind of purple and white painting? And then I showed you the, the photograph of where I was sitting at that time? So I take these real life situations and I abstract but when I got here, I mean, look at that area behind me. It's already abstract. So I was perplexed, right? What do I do? And I think it changed my work quite a lot. You'll be able to see in the exhibition, uh, exhibition um, how it's different. So this is one of the solutions that I came up with. They started to get more and more abstract, um, less colorful in some ways, a lot more um, angular, perhaps. Now, finally, the Southern Ocean, um, I was very excited to take this uh, on because it would mean that I was going to paint and sail all of the oceans on the planet. And this expedition was really, was really my own personal one. Um, so it wasn't a historical recreation of any kind. It was uh, me telling myself, I'm going to get to the Southern Ocean come hell or high water. <laughs> Almost literally. <laughs> Those are penguins that are in the background. What are you sitting on? I am sitting on some rocks. This is my waterproof kit um, of oil-based inks, um, sketchbook, which I pre-primed with oil paint ahead of time. Looks like I was able to take off my gloves. Pretty abstract, lots of violets and blues. It was uh, easily the hardest ocean to get to. So if you think about how far away the equator is from here, I mean, how, how long does it take to get to the equator? More than a day, right? To get to the equator from here, if you were to fly. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go all the way to the bottom again. So add up from here to Canada and here to the equator and then do that again. So it took me about four days um, just to get here. And that doesn't include, you know, waiting for boats and things. So it takes about a week. And that's now. Can you imagine what it was like a couple hundred years ago? All right, so some of the paintings. Let's talk paintings. Um, you will get to see both of these paintings in the exhibition. These are both from the Arctic. All right, from the Pacific, I have, um, this is actually um, from Canada. So this is from not far from here. Slightly oily, maybe. That blue, that famous Pacific Ocean blue that I love so much. This is also the Pacific, but this is from Taiwan. This is where the sun rises over the Pacific, which does my head in. The Atlantic. This is the Isle of Mo in Western Scotland. The 
This is also the Atlantic. As you can tell, this is the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> the Indian Ocean. This is Beira, Mozambique. It's funny, you know, when I when I paint these, I'm I'm not thinking about it, but I'll look back later and I'll look at a body of work that I've done from a certain place, and I can see influences that I didn't know that I had. Like I think here I was influenced by some of the fabrics and textiles that I saw people wearing in East Africa. The Indian Ocean. This is from northern Bali. Here the sand is black, which changes the color of the water. Also the Indian Ocean, Mozambique. This is a reflection of a police boat that was, um, it was, on, uh, it was on blocks, so it's out of the water. And the Arctic. See how it gets like really abstract? Maybe not. <laughs> so this is the Arctic Ocean. So how do you deal with something that's already been abstracted? This is also the Arctic Ocean. more um, psychological, I guess. Is that a good word? Emotional? Where I'm thinking about how I feel about the Arctic Ocean beyond just what it looks like. This is also the Arctic Ocean. You will see this in the exhibition. And um, this is a painting from one of the towns, if you will, I want to use that word sort of loosely, um, in the High Arctic. So this was from a Russian settlement called Pyramidin, and that had mostly been abandoned. And because uh, it's a it, it's an international uh, zone, so different countries can come in and they can have their own settlements there. It's overseen by Norway, I think, but. Um, so this is some of the detritus that they left that is reflected in the water. It just makes really great shapes. This is also the Arctic. This is from New Zealand, the highest, most, most northern uh, settlement on the planet. That's a reflection of Santa's coat. <laughs> And then the Southern Ocean. So once I got to the Southern Ocean, this is this is a reflection of a seal. <laughs> um, once I got to the Southern Ocean, it was a, a personal sense of accomplishment. And I think uh, subconsciously, so my colors went a bit wackadoodle. So you tell me what you think. It started to get brighter. The Southern Ocean. This is my newest work. Southern Ocean. You get great sunsets. Also the Southern Ocean.
course on paper as well. So we're going to be 